should kick over to live in a moment, and as soon as it does. All righty. Well, thank you all very much uh, for joining me. Uh, I'm here with Jonathan L. Howard, author of Johannes Cabal the Necromancer, uh, Lovecraft and Carter, and the Rusalka Chronicles. Um, but today, I'm going to try, not perfectly, because I am a little bit of a fanboy, but I am going to try very hard to uh, just focus on Johannes Cabal the Necromancer. Uh, so again, because I think I may have done the audio a little wrong. Uh, for anyone who is just now joining us, we are here with uh, Jonathan L. Howard, author of Johannes Cabal the Necromancer, Lovecraft and Carter, and the Rusalka Chronicles. So first of all, Jonathan, thank you so much for agreeing to do this with us today. I really, I genuinely appreciate it. I love your books. Um, absolutely. My pleasure. Awesome. Um, so the first question I've got for you is, uh, what inspired you to write Johannes Cabal, the Necromancer? Where did that idea come from? Um, that dates back to around 1990. Um, and the original intention was that Cabal was going to be the central character of a, um, of a series of short stories. Somewhere I had a list of what each of the short stories was going to be about. And I dearly wish I had the faintest idea what what had happened to that. It would have got thrown out a long time ago. But yes, it, it was going to be um, it was going to be a, a series of short stories. Um, and then, sometime in the nineties, just out of interest, I thought, how difficult is it to write a novel? Because um, I had this vague idea for a much longer story, and so I wrote chapter one of uh, what would become Janus Cabal the Necromancer um, and went, oh, that actually wasn't staggeringly difficult. Uh, it was much easier than I anticipated and then being a fool, I thought, well, if I can do one chapter, then I can do however many chapters you need to do a novel and off I went. Uh, of course, it turns into rather more of a trudge through the mud the more of a, the, a novel you write but um yeah it was it was almost an accident and uh, and, a, and a challenge to myself in the first instance but uh yeah he um that's how the book came to be written uh the actual question was where did the character come from isn't it uh, yes, yes, that was um one of the questions we have here is uh, actually was emailed into us um there's a rumor that the that the character actually sort of evolved from a D and D character. Is there is there any truth to that? No, not at all. I'm afraid. Um, um, back in. Uh, hold on. Don't mind if I have a beard. I lost you for one second there. I'm sorry. I heard okay. the character, and then you you zoned. Okay, I shall speak up. Um, the character that came from anywhere back in the mid eighties. Um, well, he came from multiple sources, none of them being a D and D character. Um, you know, um, Wizards of the Coast asked me to do um, a, a thing on Cabal in association with Fourth Edition Dungeons and Dragons. This is about ten years ago, and so I did create. Um, a necromancer character called Johannes Cabal for them, but that was after the uh, the books and the short stories had come out, well, the first book or two at any rate. So that might be where the idea comes from. Where he actually comes from um, is a bunch of different characters who came together over a period of time. Um, probably one of the most significant, oh, I'm losing an ear, but probably one of the most significant was in the mid 80s, um, Reanimator. Uh, with Jeffrey Combs, based on the the Lovecraft thing, Herbert West the Reanimator. Um, I went to see that and enjoyed it enormously in the cinema. And as is my want, I tend to cobble together sequels to films that I enjoyed. And in this particular case, I came up with a story um, where it's there's a another reanimator um and it's set in 
Britain. Uh, there used to be this vicarage in Kearsley near Bolton, and it was a very spooky looking building with a big round um, window in the gable end. And I imagine that has been where this guy lives. And he's working on reanimation through deconstructing magic on scientific principles. And West seeks him out, and that's where the story spins off. Now, at that point, the character was English, but assorted other kind of ideas for characters came together, and at some point he became German, and at some point he picked up the name Johannes Cabal. And that's really where he came from. So, in a sense, um, a reanimator a fanfic, in a way. That makes that makes total sense. Like I said, it was it was something that I had heard at one point that it was maybe based on a D and D character, and it was always one of those. Huh? I've, I'm I'm curious how that would work. But the fact that he was envisioned as sort of a as a figure for Herbert West to go and, and talk to. Uh, that yeah, he was, he was he was the foil for West, really, to start with. In fact, the the beginning of the story that I came up with for this non-existent film, um, it, I ended up recycling as the beginning of, oh gosh, uh, Johannes Cabal and the Blustery Day, which ended up being the first Cabal ever published. That was published in the H H.P. Lovecraft's magazine of horror in 2000 and something. Um, uh, and the opening of that where Cabal has an experiment run amok and has to go after it and kill it was what would have been the opening sequence of this uh, film uh, awesome just so you know we are, I'm looking at our live chat comments everyone is happy that you've got a pint I'm mildly uh, ticked at myself because I always joke that I wish I could you know, have a, have a glass when I do these and I was like, no, 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 I'll be professional. And you, you get to be awesome and have fun. So I'm, I'm, I'm mildly jealous. Um, is the image reversed? Can you read that? Uh, yes. Yes, we can. Yes, I'm having a lovely pint of atomic theory. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> so one of the things uh, that I'm very proud of is coming into, coming into Town Book Center and your book was actually my very first staff pick. It was October. It seemed very appropriate, and I was concerned. Uh, you know, how am I? Gonna, I've, I've never, I'd never hand sold a hand sold a book before, other than to friends. So I didn't know how it would go. It ended up going yeah. very well, and part of that success, all of that success, was based on your writing. But part of it was I would just tell people, look, read the first page and a half. You're going to get the tone immediately, and you'll either be very into it and go, oh my god, I love this. Or it won't be your thing, and that's that's okay too. But how did you? Was was it your plan to write such a great, you know, opening that really, really tacks in to what the the kind of essence of that story is and what kind of person Johannes is? Did it happen by happenstance? What was what's the what's the secret sauce there? Yeah, there's a bit of a story about the um, the beginning of Necromancer. Uh, um, when I originally wrote it, the, the Opening of chapter one was very discursive because I wanted it to read in a very sort of Victorian fashion and go all the way around the houses before arriving at its point. And um, uh, a couple of I showed it to a couple of friends and they went, "This is really good." Once you get past the discursive bit, have you thought of just putting something a bit more immediate in there? Um, because you sort of introduce characters who then. Or turn out to be unimportant. Why, why are you bothering with this? Um, and after, as I say, a, a couple of friends whose uh, opinions um, I valued said almost exactly the same thing independently one of one, an one another. I thought, well, perhaps they're right and I'm wrong. And I'm hanging on to this um, very Victorian Edwardian opening for no good reason. So... I had to poke around, and I had the beginning of another story, another Cabal short story that never gelled. And really all I had was the first few hundred words of it, and then it didn't go anywhere. And that was a thing called um, Cabal and the Devil's Silver, which starts with summoning a demon. And so I bodily transplanted this to the, uh, the beginning of the novel, and everybody was much happier. So that's where that came from. Awesome. Yeah, like I said, it's just, it's, it's such a funny scene, and it really does encapsulate kind of who Johannes is 
You know, yes, he's a necromancer and he's doing this magic, but he really couldn't be bothered, and it's all very silly to him. And the fact that it continues to work sort of shows he's not wrong, that magic is science with airs put on to a certain extent. Yes. And there's something really, really funny about that. Um, you've mentioned a couple of different short stories now, and so one of the questions I've got, because I, I read them all actually um, back in 2012, um, I sent you a DM on Twitter saying, hey, I keep hearing you reference these short stories, where can I find them? And you sent me a message back very politely and said, oh, you can find them right here, and I purchased them all and fell in love with them. But where, uh, were there any in particular that you really enjoyed writing, that were, that were fun for you, that you went, that was good, I like that? Um, they've all been, they've all been fun in their own ways. Um, oh gosh, because they tend to come from different places. Um, uh, for example, um, Excellent Demon King, um, came because I, I really wanted to tell a ghost story, so this was my opportunity to tell a ghost story and I'm fascinated by theatres so setting a, a, a ghost story in a theatre um, worked pretty well um, Ouroboros Uzo was a result essentially of a bet um, I, I, I used the phrase Ouroboros Uzo somewhere and, um, and somebody said I bet you can't turn that into a story so I went, oh you think um, so that's where that came from um, I remember distinctly the death of me came absolutely fully formed right from the beginning through to its conclusion every important story beat all the characters everything in the space of a single quite short bus trip it was like a 20 minute bus trip if that and I got on the bus without any idea for a story i wasn't even trying to think of a story i was just looking out the window and by the time i uh, reached my destination quarter an hour 20 minutes later i had a completely formed story so that was fun and um and then there's um a long spoon which I, i'm pushed to remember where the the core of the story came from, apart from I was quite keen. I had almost come up with the character before the story, which was um, Zeronia the Devil, the Spider Devil. Uh, I just wanted she she leapt to mind and demanded to have a story written about her, and she's terribly persuasive. So I ended up writing a story about her. <laughs> yeah, I I really enjoyed that character. Um, for people who haven't read, it comes later. Don't worry about it. No, I'm trying to keep it somewhat spoiler-free. Um, yeah. I am, uh, I'm going to try and balance between the questions that were emailed to me, the questions that I have, and the questions that I'm now seeing in our live chat, which is really, really cool. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one of the ones from the live chat now. Uh, Charlie Holloway has a question, and you should know um, Charlie is a, is a good friend of mine. Um, we had a long drive we had to take together, and we were debating what we are going to listen to, and I put on the Johannes... Cabal and the, Necrom the Necromancer audiobook, and since it was my car and I had the keys, he wasn't leaving, so we listened to that, <laughs> and uh, I, I think he'll agree that he ended up falling in love with it, um, but it is a non johannes related question. I see polyhedrals on the shelf. What is your favorite role-playing game? Oh, man. <laughs> I am literally um, The house we're in is smaller than the house that we moved out of, so we still we're going to be living in boxes forever, basically, because we've got nowhere to put anything. Out of camera shot on either side, there are wall, there's walls of storage boxes around me. And a lot of them contain role-playing games. Um, I've been into role-playing games since uh, the Doc Holmes basic D&D &D, uh, in 79. Um, B1 in Search of the Unknown. Much better model than B2. Uh, and I'll take no discussion on that. Uh, but what's my favourite system? Oh, my sainted aunt. That is very difficult. I couldn't actually tell you. I own, between physical form and um, PDFs through places like um, uh, drive through I must literally own hundreds, and I'd, I'd be hard pushed to tell you. I've played a lot of Call of Cthulhu, unsurprisingly. A lot of Traveller, um, 
I have copies of every edition of Dungeons and Dragons, um, and I I couldn't tell you what's my favourite. There's uh, James Bond 007 RPG just over there, but on top of a box. Um, yeah, it's 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 whatever the mood takes me. I I like fifth edition, um, D and D. That is, uh, it. It's a very smooth system. It, it doesn't get in the way of the role playing. Um, so I've, uh, I like that. I like third edition. I, I wasn't a spe- I wasn't a huge fan of A D and D or second edition, but I did like third, fourth. Take it or leave it. Fifth, I like. Um, so yes, <laughs> and and traveller. Um, a few months ago, dug out the ancient little black books and played traveller, and that went really well. Very cool. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch it back to the books. And by the way, anyone who's watching this and feels that I'm very disorganized, you're right. Um, and I apologize. Uh, I'm I'm trying very hard to maintain a level of professionalism, but I really love his books, and so I'm. I'm geeking out a little bit. Um, yeah, don't worry about it. I'm a thoroughly shambolic person myself, so, you know. Good. And we look at the states of this behind me. I just threw the books onto the shelves when we moved in. They're in no kind of order. Yeah, I, I, I tried to be a little thematic and put uh, four of your books here. I've got the fifth one, which is a first edition and a hardcover, in the lockbox behind me. So, um, all right. Uh-huh. <clears throat> You talked a little bit about being inspired, just being on the bus and seeing something and going, ooh, and sort of plotting it out in your head. Um, yeah. When you're writing, do you find that you're more of a plotter, a by the seam of your pants, some sort of hybrid? What, what's the process like? Um, the way I write is, uh, with novels, it's generally a case of... I don't suppose short stories to a large extent. I know where I want to go, and there are particular scenes I want to be there, and then I just kind of wing it from scene to scene. I know what's coming up. I know the effects that I want. I, I know the information that, and that I wish to convey to the reader. So, to that extent, I plot in as far as I know what the beats are going to be, and then I go see to my pants to travel between them. Uh, the one time in my life I have done a detailed um, treatment of a novel was for Johannes Cabal, the Fear Institute. I did a detailed plan of that. And then I ended up throwing out the last third of it. I thought I had a better idea. Well, literally, was bobbing around in the bath. I thought, oh, no, actually, uh, this is a much better idea than what I've got. So I ended up chucking away a third of the work. Um, and it still came back to bite me because in the UK, my publisher had been sent um, that treatment. And they used the treatment to write their advertising copy for it so they were actually describing a version of the book that never existed so since then i've been i've been very resistant to the idea of um of detailed plans so yes it's a case of um it's like traveling through an archipelago i i know the islands i wish to visit but i don't actually know what's going to happen on the stretches of sea between them that makes total sense. That I'm gonna have to steal. That's kind of how I live my life. I know where I'm going in general. I just don't quite know how we're getting there. But I know we'll get there. It'll we'll get there at some point. It'll be okay. Yeah, with uh, with short stories, there's um, again sometimes I know exactly where the short story is going. Um, I sit down knowing what the third act's going to be. With the death of me, as I say, the whole thing formed in my head. There's not a scene in there that didn't form on that bus trip. But recently I've been writing some um, um, high-ish fantasy um, stories. And part of what's appealing to them about me is that I keep throwing the characters into um, impossible situations and then thinking of a way out of it. Um, Which does mean that I tend to hit a wall because it's how blue blazers are going to get out of this impossible situation. Then uh, I, I don't. I, then I do nothing, and a week or so later, a bright idea will occur to me, and I go, "That's how they get out of the impossible situation," and I carry on writing. It's a very stop-start kind of <laughs> kind of way of doing it, but it's it's very organic, and I, 
I think it works for the, um, the slightly sort of Jack Vance style that it's being written in. It's, it's a little bit dying earth in that everybody speaks very nicely in between the acts of extreme violence. Makes complete sense to me. Um, so one of the questions that I've been asked as a bookseller and that my friends and I have debated at some length is when is Johannes Cabal, the necromancer, roughly set? At times we go, oh, it's you know, he mentions a big war and a big push home by Christmas in one scene, so it's probably post-World War I. But also, it feels very Victorian. But also, that kid used 50s slang. Where, where, where are we, more or less? Well, I can date it very exactly. Um, it set, um, it set between eighteen eighty five and nineteen fifty seven. All of it. So yeah, it's not our chronology. It's um, I I wanted that kind of slightly musty feel, which kind of peters out in the late fifties, and kind of kicks off with. Um, with the Sherlock Holmes period. And so it's this big um, steampunk into diesel punk, Victorian Edwardian into um, the unpleasantness of the, uh, the 20th century kind of thing. Uh, I mean, radio gets mentioned. Um, there's one passing reference, I think, in a short story uh, to television, and television is never mentioned again after that. But there is television in this world, but I imagine it being rare and expensive, like um, like the Alexandra Palace service from the BBC uh, before World War II. Um, very few sets out there, and, and really only one transmitter. Uh, and it's a toy for the rich at that kind of point, but it exists. Um, so yeah it's it's all bits and pieces of this um if you look at these specifications for the uh, the entomopter in johannes Quell, the detective the horsepower output and all the rest of it is very similar to an early model messerschmitt bf 109 because that's in performance that's what i based it upon so that's kind of mid to late 1930s. But yeah, it's it really is how long this piece of string. It's not our world. It's not our chronology. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting you mention uh, the Entomopter and, and the Arrow Ship, the Princess Hortense. That whole that whole book was for me a lot of fun because it's it is a very different feel. Um, so in in line with that a little bit, what inspired kind of the the mythology and world behind the series, whether it's demons, gods, spiders, the nation states of Mercavia, Senza, and Palermo? No, that's not right. Um, ooh, I forgot the name of the place in the north now. There's yeah. Polaroot across the sea. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, Catamenia. Catamenia, thank you. I, I was literally listening to the audiobook before this, and I'm going, they just did the bit with the test for kids. How do I not remember what they're called? Um, so what what inspired that world? Um, it came together piecemeal. Um, it I remember my, the, the first time I met my um, editor for the uh, British editions with Headline, um, who he went off to uh, become a, a literary agent, um, splendidly in Piers Blofeld, and apparently he's one of his ancestors went, went to school with Ian Fleming or something. That's probably where Ernst Stavro Blofeld came from. But, um, yeah, and, and he was talking about further down the road with Cabal, why don't you think of kind of expanding the universe and having stories about, you know, things that are happening elsewhere? And at the time, I was resistant to that idea because... Johannes Cabal the Necromancer is a very dreamlike book. Um, there's a sense that it's only really solid around Cabal himself as he travels through it and, and he sort of collapses the waveform of this never-never time and never-never England around him. Um, so I, I thought, no, it, it's, it's not like it's not like Discworld. It's not that well worked out. But of course, over time, detail accrues. Um, 
I wanted to write a detective story and I fancied having it very Ruritanian. So I came up with my own bunch of Ruritanian countries and the politics out in this chunk of Eastern Europe that doesn't actually exist. Um, the stuff about the, the heavier than air aero ships is it's a complete fluke. It was originally going to be um, a dirigible, like a like a zeppelin. But I did the mathematics, and for the amount of cargo space and passenger space that I wanted aboard, the gas envelopes would have to be absolutely colossal. It was too big. So um, I came up with a new branch of physics kind of um the, the idea the idea of using using the ether was very victorian so i was fine with that and the idea of gyroscopic levitation was an idea that uh, was bashed around in the um um 1980s and 1990s and had been kind of fluttering around as a as a, a pseudoscience idea for long before that so yeah it was it was very pragmatic uh i need a vessel this kind of size that can lift this kind of weight and it doesn't exist so i'll make it and that's where the aero ships come from and once i've come up with that originally it was going to be a dirigible um with um biplanes on it in the same way that some of the zeppelins could carry um, a, a scout biplane um but since i've come up with this thing this meant that i could have this lovely flat landing area at the top and i thought well if, if if i'm going to come up with one fantasy aircraft technique then why don't i come up with another one and that's so i went to the intermopt as the idea of um of aircraft that instead of using rotary wing um technology like a helicopter they use the same flight pattern as an insect so they're, they're like big artificial dragonflies that you fly around in, but they've got this very diesel punk air to them. Um, and I tried to make them feel very real world and not just something fanciful. So, yeah, uh, basically the, the great joy of writing in fantasy is that you get to make crap up, and it, it's lovely. Well, uh, everyone is all a Twitter, no pun intended, about you just designing a new branch of physics because the current <laughs> physics sucks. Oh, we've all done it. <laughs> the quote is uh, from, from Monkey Tales, physics sucked, so I built a new one, Jonathan Howard. Yeah. So there you go. Um, that should be on, on a dust jacket somewhere. I, I also have another question. I'm, I'm cheating and looking at my phone on this because I can't scroll easily on, on here without it looking terrible. By the way, I, I poured myself a beer. I figured if you're doing it, I can do Excellent. it. It's totally fine. Yeah. This is a, for people who are interested at home. This is, after all, a literary salon. Yes, yes. This is a Sour Owl. It is a sour uh, ale aged in whiskey barrels. It's quite nice. Um, uh -huh. But the question is, <clears throat> uh, Edward said he loves the maps and diagrams and wants to know, uh, did you design them yourself or did you have input on them? The maps are... Um, all my doing, so uh, you can blame me for those. I'm, I'm no kind of draftsman, but I knew what I wanted and I knew where, where I wanted it to be. So, um, again, it's a whole role-playing thing comes into it. Um, through the role-playing thing, I knew about um, a program called, um, oh, gosh, what's it called now? Campaign Cartographer. Was it Fantasy Cartographer? No, it's Campaign Cartographer. Um, which basically allows you to be a complete klutz, uh, but makes it look very pretty when you're doing maps for RPGs and things. So I used that. I started on a bit of paper and kind of blocked things out and went, yeah, it looks about right. And then, and then I created it in the program, and the program just made me look a whole bunch more professional than I actually am. So that's where the maps came from. Um, the diagrams, uh, I presume talking about the... Um, the airship Princess Hortense and the Entomopter in Detective, those two-page spreads. Those, um, in a lovely bit of serendipity, um, there's an artist called Graham Bleethman, who's very well known in, in sort of nerdy geek circles in Britain because he does these beautiful cutaways of um, science fiction vehicles, uh, especially Thunderbirds, 
and things like that, the Jerry Anderson series, Captain Scarlet, and all these kind of things, which are full of amazing vehicles. And he does these beautiful cutaways, uh, showing all their internal systems and so on and so forth. And I live near Bristol, and uh, I went to his uh, website to see um, if he be... Um, if I could commission him and discovered he lived near Bristol as well. So we actually met up and in a pub, you'll be delighted to hear. Um, and, and we got on like a, a house on fire because <laughs> we're both nerds. We were really into, uh, into all this um, jiggery poker and uh, science fiction stuff. Uh, so we got on very well. Um, I sketched out, some thoroughly childish versions of what I wanted the things to look up. He went off, did some rough sketches, came back, we discussed, um, um, uh, tidied up the ideas a bit. He went off and did final versions of it. And, uh, yeah, he did the, um, he did the Aeroship and Entomopter drawings and did a beautiful job of them, I thought. I completely agree. I think they look great. Um, I really enjoyed, in all of your books, the fun little cutaways, whether it's the the note from the head of the psychiatric facility where Rufus Maleficaris is being held, or it's the clarion, or it's, um, oh god, what was it, like the primer for different uh, chthonic elder beings. Really, really fun, and a great way to sort of break up the book. Um, Yes, they're they're fun. I always think um, they're usually the last thing to go in. Um, uh, I'm always sending uh, emails off to editors saying uh, I've almost got the interstitials ready. Bear, bear with me because that's what I call them interstitials. Stuff that just gets stuck in there to break up the flow flow of the book a little bit and just illustrate stuff out outside the main thrust of the story. So one of the things that I think is so great about your stories is you do a wonderful job of sort of balancing ridiculous with somewhat serious, and, and it's a, it's a tightrope to walk, I'd imagine. So how do you do that? How do you balance something that's kind of ridiculous, like Rufus Maleficaris, who, by the way, is one of, that's one of my favorite scenes in the books. His confrontation with Cabal is absolutely hysterical. Um, and the serious, where... Uh, you know, a good example is Johannes and Horst uh, having their argument about obsession, where, you know, Johannes claims that Horst has never been focused on anything in his life, and Horst is hmm. trying to convince Johannes that it's not focus, it's obsession. So how, how do you strike yeah. that balance? <sighs> it's nothing conscious, really. It's, it's, it's the demands of the story. Um, some things in it are ludicrous um like Maleficarus is um who's in my mind's eye is absolutely a younger Brian Blessed and he that's why he's shouting all the time wait wait he, I'm sorry uh, he, was, he was based on Brian Blessed I can't see that character my, any other way now so thank you for well, that that was <laughs> yeah my pleasure absolutely yes Brian Blessed with a big red beard um yes um, he, he wasn't based on Brian Blessed. When I was writing him, he just kind of turned into Brian Blessed, and I took it from there. Um, but yes, he, it's the demands of the story. Sometimes a scene is, is is fundamentally silly, so you lean into that. And other times, it's obviously extremely serious, so you lean into that instead. It's um, like you were saying the, the, the discussion about um, focus and obsession that's a serious subject and I might stick the occasional reasonably dry joke in bits like that but it's a serious subject and it's um, it's a question of what's appropriate to any particular moment that makes complete sense to me um, so this next one is another one from our uh, live stream that we have going right now uh, and this oh, question yeah. Yeah, uh, this question is from Kitty is a Dork. Uh, it's a good question, I think, considering our world. Would you rather be in quarantine with Johannes or Horst? <laughs> Pretty, I, it, Horst. Horst is a, a party animal. He's fun. He's affable. He has a, he has a good heart. Um Providing it does have a stake through it, yes, um, it, it would be horse. I'm afraid. Um, 
I mean, Johannes is a good person to have at your back in particular situations, but be, being stuck in, in in quarantine with Johannes for any length of time, that would get difficult. No, I'd, I'd, I'd rather spend the time with Horst. I've got all these board games lying around here. We'd have a great time. I, I was going to say, I think the answer is, I would assume the answer has got to be Horst. Um, someone, uh, yeah. Monkey Tales commented, Johannes would have killed you by the end of the first week. Reanimated you, painted your face the next day. Yeah, that seems, that seems like a stick. He's not quite that sociopathic, but he, he, he'd, find, he'd find his own room somewhere and absolutely forbid you to go anywhere near it. And you wouldn't see him for several days at a stretch. So that's so if you're looking for companionship, that kind of falls down at the first hurdle. So in a way, Johannes is the perfect roommate for an introvert. You'll see him when he's getting food, there will be no eye contact, and he'll move on with his day and just don't go into his room. Yeah, that's about the size of it, yes. Yeah. Um, so that does bring up an interesting point, though. Johannes is arguably not the sort of person you want to meet when they're having a bad day. And in some slash many cases, even when they're having a good day, it's better just to avoid them. And yet... I feel like we all like him. We all find him funny and entertaining, and there's, there is a debate, even though logically there shouldn't be, but there is a debate between would you rather quarantine with him or Horst. What, mm. how, how, how do you do that? How do you make someone who is on the surface so very unlikable into someone that we all kind of go, I'm not rooting for that guy. That is an excellent question, and I have asked myself that on so many occasions. I think... I think because at some level he's he's a moral creature. Uh, he gives the impression of being deeply immoral, but he isn't really. He's driven, um, and he's clever, and he gets out of difficult situations, and he is profoundly sarcastic um, and is funny with it it's, and his intelligence and his application he in many respects he is admirable um, but that actually makes somebody likable is is a moot question I'm when I, when I first started writing him the intention was to make somebody who was fascinating but not necessarily likable exactly um and i think that's the case for much of the first novel and then for the arc of the five extant novels he he broadens out as a person and i think does become more likable the fact that there are recurring characters who bump into him and don't hate him on sight as much in the later stories as they did in the earlier ones is indicative of the fact that um, he is becoming a better person. I, I think there's something really special about that, and it's you sort of allude to it in Detective a little bit um, when he elects not to just murder someone who mildly inconvenienced him and upon self-reflection realizes this might be his conscience coming into play. Um, so I think that he's definitely someone who's on a bit of a journey. And I think he did a great job of sort of showcasing that. Um, part of that, though, is I have to be I have to be curious, and I am trying very hard not to be spoilery. So this is going to be <laughs> spoiler esque. So okay, uh, we'll be cautious. Yes, we will be cautious. Is is Johannes honest with himself about his motivations? For doing the things that he does, does he? Is he? We know at the end of book one what kind of drives his motor a little bit, but is that honestly what it is? Is it more about himself and proving that he can do something? Is is he honest with himself? I guess, or is it all sort of dressed in pseudo scientific impartiality when it's a very basic human story? I think. I think yes, he's he's almost brutally honest with himself about what he's doing and why he's doing it. Um, but as the novels progress, he is his perspective shifts. He's certainly not the same man by, 
by the end of the fifth book that he was at the beginning of the first book. But he doesn't tend to lie to himself. Um, although he comes closest to that, I think, by uh, a sin of omission in that he chooses not to think about a thing rather than lying about it um and even then he gets again avoiding spoilers even then somewhere along the road he gets his nose rubbed in that and he doesn't deny the truth of it he, he accepts it's something that he's been avoiding thinking about in a in a similar vein do you think johannes is doing a good thing um his goal and i don't feel this is spoilery uh, he is a necromancer it says it in the title um and his do. goal <laughs> Is to is to cure death. He really does view it, or he outwardly portrays that he views it as it's a it is a, is it it is a disability, it is an illness. I'm going to cure it. Um, do the ends justify the means? If you can cure death, from his perspective, is is there anything he shouldn't do in that pursuit? I guess uh, the list of things he's not prepared to do early on is extraordinarily short. Um, but again, as he goes on, the um, the end doesn't always justify the means, and he starts to moderate his behaviour a little bit. Um, he becomes a more um, a more moral creature as it goes along, and he starts to understand himself better. As I say, he never really lied to himself, but at the same time, he. Perhaps he never actually told himself all the truth either. So, yes, as, as his as his life experience expands, as his circle expands, as he as he's put through the mangler by assorted circumstances and personalities, he is and where he's going changes fundamentally. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry, um, that made me think I've gone off at a tangent there, go on. No, 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 tangents, tangents are good. Um, I, I do mildly apologize because I'm very tangenty, and normally I'm, I'm pretty direct with these, but again, I've been reading your books now for, it's 2020, 12 years. Um, so this is, I, I'm trying very hard not to be a total fan and just go, and how did you feel <laughs> when you wrote this? And tell me about what inspired you for... So I'm, I'm trying to be professional-ish. Um, so you talked about the progression of the character, and obviously there are, are books behind me here. One of the things that I've talked about when I sell your books is that the first two, and really three, are very self-encapsulated stories. You know, you could read Johannes Cabal the Necromancer, read nothing else, and you've got a very full story. Um, yeah. The same could be said for Detective. I even tell people all the time, Look, if Necromancer sounds a little too far, feel free, but Detective sounds like it might be more your thing, you can read Detective first. There are some Easter eggy things that won't make sense, but it's fine. Um, but 4 and 5 are very much a series kind of feel. Was it yeah. always your intention to write a series, or did that evolve at some point? It, it evolved. Uh, the original intention... Uh, was that every single one of them would stand alone. But as I've intimated earlier, uh, it's a very organic process, and sometimes the bright ideas that pop up along the way are either too large to fit into a single novel or leave so many loose ends flopping around that they've got to be dealt with further down, further along the, uh, the narrative. So... Yeah, that, yeah, that's bound to happen. Um, yes, Necromancer was written to stand alone. Detective um, was written to stand alone. Um, Fear Institute was um, pretty much written to stand alone. And then I had that bright idea in the bath that I, I mentioned earlier, um, which ended up changing a great chunk of that. Uh, specifically the third act was heavily changed and that started to form into this much larger narrative which um, sort of trails off from Fear Institute uh, but leads into Brothers Cabal and then Fall of the House of Cabal um, which 
um, yeah, Fall of the House of Cabal, it really is a summation of the, uh, the four books that preceded it. And if you read it by itself, well, good luck with that. Yeah, it also felt you didn't have to read the short stories before Fall, but it definitely helps. You, you go, you, you understand who some of the characters are. Um, you go, oh, yeah, I remember her. She was the spider demon. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely not necessary. Um, so this next one is, if if Necromancer is a Faustian tale, kind of, mm-hmm. and Detective is a Hercule Poirot sort of story, and Fear Institute is inspired by the dream cycle of H.P. Lovecraft, Yeah. what are Brothers Cabal and the Fall of Cabal? Are they their own unique thing, or are they also inspired by something? Um... Well, uh, the Brothers Cabal originally wasn't going to have Johannes in at all. Um, I was playing around with it ages before I actually wrote it, and the working title was always Horst Cabal the Vampire. And apart from him just mentioning he has a brother here and there, Johannes wouldn't get a look in at all. Um, but Again, in the writing, it it changed its nature, and it became apparent to me that you know, Hannes was going to have to make a fairly major appearance, not least because of well, the way this, the story is led into. And to be honest, I, I think that works. It, it gives Horst a nice long stretch for him to be... Um, in the limelight without Johannes around and then we get to see them working together again and this time with rather more respect for one another than was demonstrated in the first book and then the the last one oh uh, gosh the last one is such a meta text it was I had an idea in my head which was almost too big for me to get it all inside my brain at the same time and I had real problems getting it into focus um i had pl- i had plenty of panics along the, along the way um and then um just some you know there's a some really basic but um good advice it, it was um it's my friend gareth l powell who who writes stuff like uh, Embers of War and whatnot. Um, we were in the pub in Bristol, and I was saying, I'm so stuck on this. And he said, just focus. Uh, bring it down into individual chunks of story. Bring those under control, and then see what you've got. Take it from there. Um, it was a very sort of broad piece of advice, but it was very nicely analytical for the problems that I was having at the time. Um, and in the space of about three sentences, he, um, he, he, he gave me a North Star to follow to, um, to finally get a handle on the story and to wrestle the thing to the ground and turn it into, um, turn it into a proper novel. Very cool. Um, so this, this next question is actually going to be one of our emailed questions. It's from uh, mm-hmm. Sarah. And Sarah wanted to know, what are some gems, some horror, science fiction, fantasy gems that you feel have not gotten as much love as they deserve, but that you are a giant fan of and you would recommend? Um, what kind of genres were those again? Horror and what? Uh, science fiction, horror, and fantasy. Right. Um, well, straighten with science fiction. I mean, the one way I always dig my heels in and I'm outraged that he's not far, far, far better known than he actually is, um, is John Sladek, who, as far as I'm concerned, was a towering genius, um, and yet most of his stuff seems to be out of print these days. So, from a science fiction point of view, um, and satire, because he, he wrote satire. In fact, his, most of his science fiction is satire, uh, and occasional surrealism. So, John Sladek, absolutely. Um, f- fantasy... I, I don't think any of my favourite fantasy things are especially obscure, so there's, there's nothing I can really clamber up the ramparts and start waving the flag for. I'm very fond of um, 
Michael Moorcock's Elric of El- Malnibody stories, for example. They're, they're not exactly obscure. Um, Jack Vance, who I mentioned earlier, Dying Earth and all that. I'm fond of those as well. And the um, these highish fantasies that I was talking about earlier that I'm writing at the moment have at least a nod to... Um, oh, gosh, I can't remember how to pronounce his name now. Fritz Leiber. It was Leiber rather than Lieber, wasn't it? Or was it Lieber rather than Leiber? One of the two, him. Um, and to an extent, him. He at least gets uh, a nod. So in terms of fantasy, I don't think there's anything um, staggeringly unusual. Horror? I read a lot of Victorian and, uh, and Edwardian stuff. And um, so there's the obvious, there's the obvious guys in there. Um, oh, no, I'm so poor with names, even famous names, they fly out of my head. Um, Nathaniel, come on, help me out here, Blackthorn? Uh, maybe. Okay, um, yeah, I, hmm, maybe. and, um, ooh, and, um, Macken to an extent, uh, I'm not a massive Macken fan, but he did do some good stuff. Um... Uh, William Hope Hodgson. Oh, uh, Charlie says Lieber. Lieber, thank you. Yes, apparently he was he was quite punchy about that. If you called him Lieber, he would take a swing at you. Um, so yeah, Fritz Lieber. Um, oh no, no, he's saying. I'm sorry, he's saying Lieber. He capitalized lie. So. All right, Lieber, Lieber. In that case, he takes a swing at you. You say he's, Lieber. He's correcting me as I talk, which he was a former <laughs> teacher of mine. That well, seems right. Um, uh, oh gosh, names just fl- maybe I shouldn't have had this beer after all. Uh, the chap who wrote uh, the Wendigo and all that. Oh, um, oh, oh gosh, I know that one too. Um, da. uh, but also, um, uh, I mean, felt like, um, uh, Vernon Lee. Um, I just happened to pick up a collection of Vernon Lee a few years ago and I was bowled over by that. Um, she wrote a lot of um, Italianate stuff, and um, I, I make a nod to that in Detective. The whole thing with Senza being very, um, very Italian. That was that was actually a deliberate nod to Vernon Lee. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure there's anybody I like who's really that obscure, apart from I. I I will clamber onto the parapets for John Sladek every time. So we've got uh, several people who said Algernon Blackwood. Algernon Blackwood. So who am I? Nathan- yeah, Algernon Blackwood and Nathaniel Hawthorne, isn't it? It's very irritating. I've got a bunch of books over there, and apart from you know taking off my earbuds and going over and having a look at some spines, I can't really do that, and I can't read them from this distance. But um, yeah, that guy over there, I like his book. Yeah, that, oh, that one, that well, one in the was... corner. Um, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. I've got my my what I consider rare and signed and first edition books signed, you know, stuck behind me, and I I periodically look over my shoulder and I'm like, oh, that's Conan Doyle, that's Lovecraft, that's Rowling, that's Martin, that's Howard, that's actually I do have my my uh, King in Yellow, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so one of the other questions that we oh, got... Oh, James is good. Yeah, I liked it. Oh, yeah, yeah. actually, if you curious, this is a first edition uh, King in Yellow. I mean, English first edition. Obviously, it was originally written in French, but it took really? me five years to find this book. Yes, I traveled all over New Hampshire looking for it. It's a whole thing. Um, wow. Yeah. But uh, the next question we've got via email. Okay. Um, Dennis and Denzel... Are, and I'm saying this less for you and more for the people listening at home in case they don't remember. Dennis and Denzel are two highwaymen who attempt to rob Johannes upon his return from hell. It does not go well for them. That is no. not a spoiler, I don't think. It's very early in the first book. And they are, in fact, the first people who Johannes practices his arts on that we get to see. Yes. Is there any chance that we will ever see a Dennis and Denzel short story or full book, whatever, you know, whatever you've got? <laughs> I don't know about a book. I'm not sure I could keep Dennis and Denzel going for uh, 80,000 words or something. But short story, yes. I have played around um, with ideas for um, 
some they would be short i mean because they're not great on the dialogue after all let's be honest uh but yes i have indeed played around with the idea of some very short like 2000 words tops um stupid adventures with dennis and denzel um, yeah, one of the one of the suggestions we have here is Dennis and Denzel, chaotic dumbasses. Uh, that's yes, from, that's, from that's pretty much the size of them. Yeah, they, yes, <laughs> there's something very nasty in the woodshed, and it's called Dennis and Denzel. Yes, perfect. Um, another email question I've got: um, Why a Webley point five seven seven boxer? That handgun is completely ridiculous. I will be honest. I googled the handgun when you first mention it in actually the scene with Dennis and Denzel. Um, yeah. And I was blown away with absolutely how ridiculous that gun is. It is it is a hand cannon, no it's pun intended. Monstrous, isn't it? So what was the what was the logic there? Well, um, this dates back a long way. Um, when I was a teenager, um a friend and I used to do um, target shooting with air rifles. And we both used uh, Webleys. And he wrote off to Webley for some, some bit of gear or something. And they sent him a pile of advertising stuff. And in amongst this was kind of history of Webley. And we were flicking through it. And we went, just a minute. Did, did I originally just see that? And it was a reproduction of a, a cardboard standee, which had apparently been used in gun shops in the 1870s or something. And it's so thoroughly colonial. And it's um, Webley 577, Guarantee to Stop a Charging Savage. That's what it was intended for. It's a hand cannon for killing people at point blank range. Um, and the reason it's such a massive caliber is that at the time, the um, the propellants in the guns uh, was it was kind of low low grade cordite or something, and you couldn't develop very high muzzle velocities. So to get the kinetic energy necessary to kill somebody who's really very keen on killing you at point blank range. You did it by increasing the caliber, and that's why the 577 is virtually like a, it's a handheld mortar almost. It's with this ridiculously uh, wide caliber on it. Um, and, uh, and I make reference to the um, guarantee to stop a, a charging savage, which is original, actual advertising copy from the 1870s um in detective i think when cabal's replacing his gun because he gets for an awful lot of handguns as he goes along and um the the gunsmith comes out with this uh, phrase and cabal replies in the long lines of um well i don't know about that but it can certainly stop a deep one with his dander up so you know Perfect. Yeah, it, like I said, it, it's it's a ridiculous looking handgun. Um, I have a friend actually who owned it was a Webley Mark IV, and we went out to a gun range and we were playing around with it. And I mean, that thing was a wrist breaker, and that wasn't even the point five seven seven. That's I a four five five, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. I, I yeah. can't even imagine playing with that, so to speak. Um, so this next yeah, question, it's, it's, it's oh, a ridiculous sorry. gun, and it just struck me as the weapon for somebody who's not interested in weapons but is interested in killing things that are trying to kill him so that's why i went for it so these next questions are coming from instagram um uh -huh. and i'm trying to, to balance everybody so if you feel like i'm not getting attention i'm not getting your attention please let me know via the comments in our live chat um all right munchy tales i'm i'm reading now is actually how i should be pronouncing that munchy so munchy tales writes as uh -huh. a bisexual disaster it is nice to see a book whose main character is a bisexual disaster as well. Do you have a problem with people viewing your monogamous main characters as bisexual? Not at all. Um, it, it, a lot of this comes down to the thing about once a, once a book is 
out of your hands and published and it's out there in, in, in the great outdoors, it's no longer really your book. It's whatever people make of it. Um, Johannes, I, I, I've never really thought of as bisexual. Horst, very possibly. Um, Johannes, uh, I don't know, maybe. Um, I haven't asked him. But um, yeah, if, if that works for you, knock yourself out. Um, I don't believe there's anything in the books that actually supports that, but there's nothing that specifically says no either. So, so no, no. Uh, as I say, once it's out there, it's no longer my book. It's a reader's book. So, have fun. It makes complete sense to me. And uh, and yeah, like I said, uh, we, we we do have one more of a similar sort of vein uh, again from uh -huh. Instagram. Uh, Glorious mud. Uh, oh my god, this is awesome. I'm a huge fan of the Cabal books. If you don't mind, can I ask, what do you think of people headcanoning head your characters? Yeah, that beer may have been a mistake. Uh, your characters <laughs> as LGBT or POC, even if they're not described as such in the canon. Thank you so much. And how do you come up with the plots for your stories? So, Well, the answer to the first part is, is the answer to the previous question. It's... Um um, I'm absolutely cool with it. Um, yeah, the, if you if you want to see them uh, in a particular way, that's fine by me. I, I'm I'm just glad you're enjoying the book. That's the important thing. As long as it's entertaining, I write these things to entertain. I'm, I don't. Yes, the politics definitely leaks in here and there especially i mean if, if we've been talking about cabal but if you look at carter and lovecraft um those are really very political in places and even the uh, the rusalka chronicles uh touches quite heavily on on politics because um it, it goes into it goes into causes of war and this kind of stuff it's not something that can be avoided um but um, I've completely forgotten the point I was making, but yes, it's essentially, it's essentially whatever it is to you. So um, yeah, enjoy. As for where the plots come from, um, again, it's here, there, and everywhere. Um, sometimes there's a, there's a particular effect I'm looking for. Sometimes, especially with the uh, the short stories, I, I think of how I want the story to end, and I find my way to it. Um, and frequently there's an awful lot of making it up as I go along. Uh, sometimes it's almost like a flow of consciousness. Um, Ouroboros Uzo uh, more or less wrote itself. Um, I just kind of knew what I wanted to happen, and then I, I, I let the spirit flow, and off it went. And um, a, a long spoon was really an excuse for um, two, two characters, both of whom I like, to um, to chat for several thousand words um, and then have a bit of a problem to come together. So, yeah. Um, the plots come from hither, thither and yon. All the dark corners. All the dark corners. That makes all sense. Actually, fun fact, I think I have... No, it's Dark Brotherhood. That I have from uh, Lovecraft up on the shelf there. Uh, yeah. Another one from Instagram, um, right. from the Urban Changeling. <clears throat> I've got two Ooh. from from them. One. Okay. Oh, would you consider writing more about Miss Virginia's Flying Circus or Minty? And two. Uh, what does the red carnation symbolize? Right. Um, Miss. Virginia Montgomery and her flying circus. Um, yes, I have actually played around with ideas for a spin-off novel. Um, what we were talking about earlier about how my very first editor was saying, "Oh, you should you should write a, about Cabal's world, even if it's stories that don't necessarily involve Cabal." And at the time, I was like, "No, no, it, it, it's basically him. He's the one who creates a world around him as he goes." Um, and now there's at least two spin-off novels I've got in mind. And one of them is The Further Adventures of Miss Virginia Montgomery and uh, her pilots. And uh, the other one is... Um, 
has got the working title of um, Miss Lini Barrow and Madame Zerania's Grand European Tour. So that might be a thing as well. Ooh. Okay. Um, and the second question, I'm a little boggled by this red carnation. I don't actually remember a red carnation. All right, so I'm going to try. Uh, my memory is such. <clears throat> in Detective, once Johannes Cabal <laughs> departs from the Princess Hortense, he is in Senza. He is feeling mm -hmm. particularly good about himself. He's done his whole disguise, and he uh, acquires a red carnation. And is it's like it's it's a it's a little moment where he someone is selling flowers, and he goes, "Yeah, okay," and he, he puts it on himself, and he's he's excited to have it. If whoever that is, uh, the urban changeling, is in the live chat right now, please, 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 please. Put a message in there so I know I'm doing your question, uh, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a good job with your question um, because I don't remember it anywhere else. If I'm being completely honest, doesn't mean it's not there. I've read these books yeah. six or seven times, I, I, but I, I miss things all the time. So I remember it being there, and I, I have a vague recollection. Let's see, in Necromancer. There was the red tickets, which were like pomegranate-like red, which is a throwback to Persephone and yeah. pomegranate seeds. Um, in did he wear a flower? Did he have a flower symbol on him by any chance? Maybe in I don't oh, know. hold on, Alfie T. Hold on, <laughs> I, I'm mystified by the carnation. Yeah. Thing. Alfie T. It's me. All right, Alfie. So what? Where? Where is? Is there a carnation anywhere else? Um, that we that we see that I can ask about because I'm sure there is I just I can't remember it outside of that moment. Um, and while we wait for Alfie, let's, mm -hmm. give, let's give them a moment. Um, okay. The the next question that I've got for you is going to be this. Um, oh wait, hold on. Uh huh. There, uh, Alfie T. There's the red flower on the detective. I think, Alfie, are you talking about the cover? Because if so. Oh, the cover of Fear Institute. Yeah. Oh, oh I mean. I, we're talking about uh, yes. Yes, oh, blind. there, is, there is, is a red carnation there. All right, I'm going to switch uh, back over to full. Jonathan. <laughs> um, you're you're going to have to speak to Michael J. Windsor. That was one of his <laughs> affectations. He's the guy who did the cover. Um, I think it's very pretty, but it's not really anything to do with the story. Um, this is the thing, the, the covers are done quite early on in the process, um, which is, I love um, Michael's covers. Um, my only caveat with any of them was the cover of Detective. Um, it was finalised before I'd managed to do the interstitials with how the Princess Hortense actually looks. So on the cover of the book, it's a dirigible, and it shouldn't be a dirigible. Um, that's my only caveat with any one of the five covers. And even that, it's still a gorgeous cover, even if it's got a dirigible on it. Um, the, the business with the uh, the flower on the cover, I he put it on because it was pretty. It's not actually something in the story, as far as I recall. And it's funny you should mention the dirigible, because literally one of the comments from Munch, uh, from Munchie Tales... <laughs> Uh, yep, that explains the Zeppelin. So it, it, you were you were definitely picking up on that for sure. Um, yeah. So let's see. The next question that I've got for you is going to be one of the ones that I came up with because I'm going to go back to myself for a moment. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, I lie. I lie. Someone just asked in the live chat, and I don't think I've gotten to them yet. Um, okay, so this is today, are, today for are you. Uh, what do you think about fan art? Have, do you have any favorites? Anything you're miffed with that hasn't been picked up by fan artists? Uh, today, if you are a fan artist, which it sounds like maybe you might be, uh, this might be your opportunity to, to see what you could send to Jonathan. I love fan art. I don't know any author who isn't really fond of fan art. It's, um, it's just lovely to see that something you've created Sparks in other people's imaginations and produces you know, other stuff. Um, I mean, I know there's um, there are people producing um, cabal 
fanfic on uh, an archive of her own, which I have to point out, I avoid like the play for legal reasons. You know, it's it's just really bad for an author to end up reading something else, and then if further down the line you come with some come out with something close to it, or even heaven forfend unconsciously plagiarize it because it's lurking in your unconsciousness or whatever, or even worse, I suppose it's quite conceivable to consciously plagiarize it, but let's not go there. Um, yeah, you're leaving yourself open into all kinds of unpleasantness, so I stay away from an archive of our own. But fan art, yes, I can glory in fan art. I'm safe with that. So, yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely adore it. Excellent. And it looks like... Uh today for our you is posting to Twitter because apparently that's where they all are. Um, this next question is from Brandon. Uh, so as someone who writes uh, a, a lot, do you prefer when you play your role-playing games, do you prefer to be a player, do you prefer to run the games, and this is my own twist on it at the end, does Johannes or any of the other characters ever sort of come out when you're, when you're doing this? Um... Over the years, I've GM'd far more than played, but that's just because of the way things have worked out, I think. I actually really enjoy playing. Um, it's, it's nice to be in somebody else's adventure and to be, and to be playing a role, a, a single role that you can settle into properly. Whereas with a GM, it's like, you remember those old variety acts with the guy with the box of hats and he's slapping them on and off and changing his accent with every, every time. Um, that can get confusing, <laughs> um, and gaming can be hard work. I, I can relax more as a player, um, but I do like telling the stories from the uh, the point of view uh, of a GM. But of the two, I think I maybe marginally prefer playing, but I really enjoy games mastering as well. Um, in terms of Cabal or any of the characters turning up in everything I've ever run or played, no, no, not really. Um, um, I, I like playing characters who are very different from me, which makes me sound as if I think I'm Cabal now, but, um, yeah, I get, I, I it's an opportunity to play somebody who's kind of a little bit out of your comfort zone. And I spend so much time in Cabal's shoes. I mean, if you look at it, there's all the short stories. There's five novels. I finished a Cabal novella earlier in the year. Um, I think if you add it all up, there must be six, seven hundred thousand words of Cabal stuff floating around. I'm very familiar with Cabal, and you know, I spend a lot of time with him anyway. So when I'm playing, I'd like to step away from him for a bit. That makes complete sense. Um, I actually, it's it's very pleasant. I'm in the middle of a game myself, where I'm actually a player. It's the first time in ten years, so I, uh, I'm really nice enjoying it. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. It's nice to not have to figure out what happens when the hexagon map ends. Um, yeah. So the next... Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. It was interrupted by the um, COVID-19 and all the rest of it, but a um, uh, friend's running a um, a d and game at the moment, and I play a um, half half orc female ranger in that. So, you know, that's a fair distance from Cabal, and that's who I wanted to play, so that's what I'm playing. No, that makes total sense to me. Um, so this next question, I will be honest, was earlier in the live chat. I, I, I don't remember who asked it, so I apologize to whomever that is. Um, but, is there a person who you enjoy writing more than someone else necessarily? Whether it's Johannes, or Horst, or uh, the wizard who you know, had the, the pocket dimension where everything sort of went sideways. Is there anyone who, who you really enjoyed writing for? Um, I like I like writing Zeronia. She's a lot of fun. Um, and she's funny and 
she likes killing people so you know it's an interesting combination really um and the single possibly the, the single best pun i've ever come up with in my life i gave to zaronia so that, that's the high regard i with which in which i hold her. she's just enormous fun to write she's um she's sort of there was british actress uh who was very busy in the 50s and the 60s in particular uh by the name of joyce grenfell and she had very sort of uh, jolly hockey sticks kind of voice and that's the voice i imagine with zaronia so the idea of um a sexy joyce grenfell which if you know joyce grenfell is yeah. an interesting concept in and of itself uh and that's kind of her that's her vocabulary that's her kind of mindset that and the killing people uh but being sexy about it so yeah and she has there's a, there's a kind of um, naivety about her, almost. And some of that is an affectation, but not quite all of it. So, yeah, I, I, I really like writing her. And she's she's a fun to write with Cabal, because Cabal's obviously a much drier and generally more laconic person a lot of the time. And he's in a position where he... he he likes her and he's she's one of the vanishingly few entities in the entirety of creation that he likes so it's nice to write cabal being friendly for once oh 100 percent. i i think that there's something really wonderful about when he is genuinely interested in a human being um whether it's horse i mean human being is a bit nebulous yeah, very relative here, yes. yeah. Uh, but <laughs> But I think there's something really wonderful about that. Um, one of the questions that I've got here, uh, and this one was via email. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So you touched on this a little bit earlier. What is it like being a UK author published in, this, in, in the United States? What sort of hurdles did you have? Was it more difficult? What, what, what's that whole process like? Oh, this is complicated. Um, if if I tell you every one of the bizarre business steps that led to this situation, we'll be here all evening. But essentially, when I was first published, I was published in the UK first by Headline. And they published the first three Cabal novels. And in the US, Doubleday took it on for the first two novels. So I ended up writing three, but only two of them were published in the US. And then Doubleday went, yeah, they, they sell reasonably well, but we're not going to pick up the third one. And we're, oh, okay, your choice. And then, amazingly, um, my agents, and again, to complicate things, I, have a, I had a UK agent and a US agent, because of associated agencies. My US agent managed to cut a deal where Thomas Dunbar books, which is part of Macmillan, picked up the third one and also wanted another two books after that, um, which is almost unheard of, um, a, a different publisher picking up a continuation of a series. Um, so I ended up writing, they published Fear Institute and then I wrote Brothers Cabal and Fall of the House Cabal for them. Back in the UK, a headline wasn't interested in picking up those latter two. So the latter two have never been published in the UK, um, which is irritating. Um, if you see them on a bookshelf, they are imports in the UK. Um, and they're not available on Kindle because I don't have a UK publisher. Uh, I think I'm going to have to do that myself. It's the only way they're going to come out an ebook over here. Um, so yes um essentially it's it all it's it's a huge dog's dinner um created by publishers blowing hot and cold over oh yes we want this book but we don't want that one and oh, yeah, yeah. so yes this this is the mess in which i find myself um and i feel especially sorry for people in the uk because they can lay hands on the first three books easily enough but then when they want four or five they have to start jumping through hoops for them. 
That that that's a real shame because it's it's funny. I uh, I read your first book in two thousand and eight, and then I was living in Scotland, and I went to a Waterstones actually, and I I saw Detective, and I went, holy crap! That I didn't know he wrote a sequel. Oh my god! And I went and I bought it. So the fact that it's not available at all in the UK is is really very sad to me. Um, well, the first three books are. It's uh, the latter two that aren't. Ah yeah yeah. Um, I, I've got a question here from our live stream. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> let's see. Oh, there we go. From Edward Kristen. Is there any way to access the Broken Sword series that you worked on outside of the UK? I have a feeling. I mean, I haven't checked. Um, but might it be on Steam? I know they did a revised version of it a few years ago. Um which a little risably was called the director's cuts, uh, which makes me smile because the the original version that went out in ninety five was absolutely the director's cut. It's the, the the new version they should have called Redux or something because it's expanded upon. Um, I think that's possibly available on Steam. I don't know. I haven't checked, um, but. To the best of my knowledge, um, none, certainly none of the first couple of Broken Sword games have ever been entirely unavailable legally, um, which is remarkable for an adventure game. Um, how many other adventure ga- 25-year-old adventure games are still available, um, you know, legally for sale? Um if it, they're not on Steam, I suppose there might be versions lurking on GOG. I don't know. It's um, I, I don't know. So <laughs> that's the bottom of, bottom line. They should be out there um, legally somewhere. Uh, I do emphasise legally because I've I've worked crumbs. I've worked uh, thirty years in the games industry and. Um, I know the damage piracy does, so legally is always important. For what it is worth, uh, Brandon says they are available on Steam. So, if you need these games, you you can definitely get them on Steam. Um, I've got a couple more questions from our live chat. Uh, Mm -hmm. Let's see. So, this one, um, you sort of alluded to this earlier a little bit. But would you prefer to see Johannes Cabal as a movie or an HBO style miniseries, and if so, um, what? How how would you cast them? Is there anyone you go, oh my god, we have to have so and so? Oh, now this is the thing. Um, I'm I really like the cinema experience. So my my initial gut feeling is to say film, but. If I'm being realistic about it, I think it would work better as a TV series. Um, it wouldn't be a cheap TV series. I mean, just in terms of um, having a having a, a steam train and the Princess Hortense and all the rest of it, um, there's going to have to be some sets and a significant amount of green screening going on. Um, but I can imagine it working better as a TV series, especially because that would allow you to. Um, fold the short stories in as and when they're needed and kind of flashbacks and episodic bits. Um, as for casting, well, back in the day, and this is pre-Loki, people um, kept going on about some guy called Tom Hiddleston for Cabal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he was the right age and everything at that point. He's probably a little old to play Cabal, certainly as, he's, uh, as he is in the book now, Cabal being in his late 20s. And, you know, looking at Hiddleston and his performances, yes, actually, he would have worked pretty well. Um, more recently, um, somebody suggested the guy who plays Pennywise in the most recent version of It. Um, and, you know, I can imagine him as well. Obviously not under the white makeup and the funny hair and all the rest of it, but that act, I've seen him in other stuff as well. And, um, yeah, I can imagine him. Um but I, I'm not above putting actors into my the cinema of my mind when I'm organising a scene. 
uh, as I'm writing it, it's just that they don't tend quite to be central characters. I've never really cast Johannes or Horst or even Leonie um, in my mind's eye. Um, Brian Blessed, kind of a uh, younger Brian Blessed, anyway, um, snuck up on me for um, Malificaris, Malificaris when I was writing him. Um, I'm just trying to think of other actors who kind of no the, the, the cabal the cabal characters tend to tend to pop into my head pretty well formed as mentally synthesized and me not mentally casting people in particular roles uh, nine times out of ten. Very occasionally later I'll be looking at somebody and go, oh, actually, they'd make a good whoever. But um, uh, the casting for Cabal has always been other people's suggestions. That makes total sense to me. I, uh, we have a bunch of, of live chat questions, which for me is really fun. Uh, we've done uh-huh. several of these events, um, and generally people watch, but they're not as involved as they are, as they have been with you so far, so that's been oh, that's wonderful. Nice. So let's Hello, start... Everybody. <laughs> Let's start with boarded books, sir. All caps there, sir. Would sir. you would you write an adventure based game based in the world of of the Cabal series if you could? You know, um, when the first book was coming out, um, and Doubleday was saying, "So let us get this straight. You you've designed adventure games." And I said, "Yeah," and they said. We've got this great idea. Why don't you do an adventure, a cabal adventure game, and we can uh, use it as marketing, as a marketing tool for the book? And I went, sure, I'll design that for you. And they said, yeah, you've got to code it and do the art. And I said, that's not actually how game development works. I'm a designer and a, and a narrative uh, um, writer, but I, I don't code worth spit. And he got, have you seen my artwork? No, no, that's not happening. Um, but I can price it for you. And they went, oh, yeah, okay, how much would it cost? So I, I did some, I thought, quite conservative pricing for a, a small adventure game. And they looked at it, and I sent it to them, and they never spoke of it again. So that was that for the adventure game front. Um, yeah, if somebody's uh, prepared to throw uh, an obscene amount of money at me, I'd be perfectly happy to write a, um, a Cabal game. Yeah, that makes that makes complete sense. I, uh, I, I would, I mean... To me, when I think of running a game, I think of running like a role-playing game. I, I selfishly go, well, clearly, clearly I would absolutely play that. Um, let me make sure I'm getting a text. No, it is not related to this. Okay. For what it's worth, uh, Nevar23 and... Uh, all right. Techiebird? Yep. Mm-hmm. Techiebird said that they would absolutely play that game... That would be the thing. In fact, Kitty is a dork is suggesting that we start a Kickstarter for Johannes <laughs> Cabal, uh, the adventure game. By the way, I would absolutely throw money at that because, oh my god, I think it would be hysterical. <clears throat> oh, good. Oh, yeah, dear. I was going to say, you're sitting there doing great more that, work. That, Hooray. Um, all right, so the next question I've got, um, this is not one on the list here, but I'm, I'm waiting to see what I've got over here. Uh, oh, Techie, I did get that right. Um, you wrote a character, Frank Barrow, and I yes. felt like in reading Necromancer, Frank Barrow was very much the opposite side of the coin for Johannes Cabal. Very, very similar in their outlooks, very, very similar in their approaches at times, but whereas Johannes viewed everything from the most negative lens possible, Frank viewed them from the most positive lens possible. Was that intentional? Was Am I reading too much into that? What was going on with Frank Barrow? Um, yes. Uh, to a large extent, Frank Barrow is um, a very measured antithesis of uh, Johannes. Uh, the fact that they end up um, as nemesis and nemesis in, um, in Necromancer. Uh, they're both equally driven. They both have important things in their life that they wish to protect at all costs. Um, they're both smart, um, and they're both very capable in the in their particular specialities. They, um, but 
Yes. Um, Johannes is amoral, whereas Frank's heavily moral. So there is a degree of it in a glass darkly going on there. Okay. <clears throat> All right. This next one is an email question. Um, mm -hmm. It's a part one and part two, really. Do okay. you collaborate with anyone, uh, in particular, the lyrics to Necromonicon? And have you ever considered writing the Necromonicon? Uh, for those of you who are at home who have not necessarily gotten there or read the books, Necromonicon is a musical to the Necronomicon. The only song of which we know is Big Squid Head Lies Are Sleeping at the Bottom of the Sea. <laughs> yeah, the um, uh, Necronomicon the musical. Um, uh, Big Squid Head, no, I wrote it. I, wrote all, I, I write all the nonsense. I, I, I didn't collaborate with anybody on any of that god-awful doggerel from any of the books. It's all my fault. Blame me. Oh, hold on. I, 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 yeah. Uh, it's funny to mention Necronomic and Musical actually as a thing that's happening. On two occasions, musicians have been in contact with me to say, do you fancy doing Johannes Cabal in some kind of musical form? Um, uh, one of the composers was interested in doing it as, uh, as an operetta, and the other one was interested in doing it as a musical. Um, neither of these things came to anything, but the fact that this happened, um, again, in, entirely unrelated to one another. Again, makes me excited about the whole thing about my writing sparks ideas in people's heads. So, uh, uh, Munchie Tales says that they require the Necromonicon. So, if, uh, if you feel yourself bored <laughs> and you need something to do, just know there is an audience for a Necronomicon-themed musical. Um, I can tell you as a bookseller, I think it'll work. We have the Omnomnomicon, which is a Necronomicon-themed cookbook. And yes, the, oh uh, god, what is it, um, Cthucken, which is a, uh, octopus stuffed inside of a chicken, stuck inside of a duck, stuffed inside that? of a yeah. turkey. We have that, it's in the cookbook, it's there for right you. There. Yeah. That's something I was not meant to know. <laughs> Probably very true. Um, all right, so the next question I've got here is, um, Johannes himself is a very complex feeling character. On the one hand, he is funny, very funny. I don't think anyone could argue that. On the other hand, he can be a bit of a jerk. Um, but at the same time, you have moments like the train station scene, where mm. he is very, very clearly a, a good person. How do you write someone like that who can straddle the line between these people are annoying me, I should probably just murder them, and I'm going to help this ghost because, oh my gosh, war is horrible, and let's talk about that. <sighs> yeah, no, if you, if, to reduce it to um, sort of points and, and why this particular thing and why that particular thing, I couldn't tell you. It just... It just felt right in the um, in the writing. Um, Cabal is, despite what any number of um, magistrates and torch-bearing villagers might think, Cabal is not purely evil. Um, there is a lot of grey, even in the even in the first book where he is at his most unpleasant. Um, there's still plenty of flecks of grey. In amongst the darkness of uh, of his personality, um, and sometimes, oh, yeah, it, it it sounds a bit of it sounds like nonsense if you haven't um, written much fiction. The way that characters sometimes surprise you by doing something that is true to the character, even if it's not quite what you had planned for them, but you go with them because it feels more natural and. Scenes like that, they, they come out of the character. Um, I'm not pretending uh, Cabal leaned out of the, uh, the monitor and started typing his own story or anything like that, but he just felt felt the kind of thing he would do. So I went with it. That makes total sense to me. 
Um, so, for all of our people who are listening at home, by the way, uh, this is, I think, I'm, if I say I think, I'm fairly certain, uh, this is our most uh, viewed, while it's live, video so Ooh. far. So, all of you are Hello, absolutely everyone. wonderful. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, it's going to be live. <laughs> I've never. I'm going to give you guys another couple minutes to put together some last minute questions that you might have for Jonathan. Uh, before we wrap it up, because I told him, eh, 45, 40 minutes, you know, it shouldn't be that long. <laughs> we're, uh, we're coming up on a little, almost two hour, hour and a half, hour and a half now. Yeah, it's, uh, so I, 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 I want to let him get to sleep. Um, so I am going to ask him two more quick questions. Come up with whatever questions you've got. We'll try and run through them roughshod, and then we'll ask him our okay. final question, and we will let him go. So, Jonathan, while yes. they figure out their questions, uh, Two quick questions for you. Right, sir. <clears throat> One. If you were to play Johannes Gabal in some sort of role-playing game, do you have a system that you would prefer to put him into, or does it really not matter? He's His personality is what's going to shine through here. Um, I have bolted together versions of... Johannes for 4th and 5th editions and Pathfinder 1st edition. But if I was going to play Cabal as Cabal, I'd probably use um, Call of Cthulhu um, because that would model him quite nicely. Um, And depending on which version, I'd probably use um, a home-brewed magic system and avoid mucking around magic points and that kind of thing um but otherwise call of Cthulhu, um leans heavily into the narrative so that might work or something leap into mind uh trailer cthulhu um which is a system that was put together by kenneth height i think it was which is very investigative driven um, and considering how often Cabal finds himself in mysteries, um, a Cthulhu system that specifically majors on um, investigation and solving things, that might work really well for him. So I'm going to go with Trail of Cthulhu. Makes sense. Uh, we actually had a Call of Cthulhu game that was run by uh, Charlie here in the chat, and uh, we, we won it, which is apparently not a thing you're supposed to do, because it was impressive. I was proud of us. Huh? Seems like I may have lost you there. For a second. There we are. Um, all right. So one more, uh, one more question for me before I ta- launch into these, and then we'll do our last question of our event here. Um, uh-huh. So you've written something that clearly has touched a lot of people. Um, like I said, forty-one concurrent viewers. Um, I haven't even looked yet at the people who started the stream late and were trying to catch mm-hmm. up. Um, when you were putting together this idea for Johannes, was that ever something that you thought was going to... Did, did you look at this and go, oh yes, this is mass appeal, People are gonna, everyone's going to love this, this is going to be a thing that everyone really latches on to, or was it something that you just went, I'm doing this for me, and I, I want to put this out into the world? Awfully selfish of me, but more the latter. Um, I think most authors will admit that um, certainly they're, they're, they're sort of self-generated uh, this is going to sound very business like they're self-generated IP they're, the, the stuff they come up with as opposed to writing in license or so on and so forth comes from them, it's from their enthusiasms, it's what's the bottom line is it's a book that I'd like to read and it doesn't exist so I'd better write it, that's what Johannes Kamal the Necromancer was. It was a book that didn't exist, but I was desperate to read it, and nobody else was going to do it, so I suppose I ought. And and that's true of the others as well. There are always things that intrigue me. Um, the first one, because it's this, it's this very... Um, oh, I forgot the word. Um, episodic... Um, yeah, blur, no, I can't remember. Um... But this 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 traveling story, which, as if you recall, I said originally the idea for Cabal was it was just going to be a series of short stories, and to an extent that's why 
the first two thirds, or at least once you're through the introductory chapters, there's those group of very episodic things. At least a couple of those were originally on that piece of long lost piece of paper with uh, short story ideas. Um, Eternity in the Garden was going to be one of the short stories, and that ended up being the, the chapter with Rufus Malficarus. Um, so, yes, it's, um, it's, it's, it's highly selfish. It's, um, I've had this really cool idea and it wants out of my head. Um, so I'm going to inflict it all on you. Tough. And that's kind of where it comes from. And, and I think that makes total sense. That's been, every advice I've ever been given from anyone when it comes to writing is, if you feel like there's a book that you want and there isn't a book out there that, that covers that yet, you should go write it. So that sounds completely accurate to me. All right. Yeah. So I've, I've, I've got our questions from everyone in the live chat. <coughs> Let's give it a try. <coughs> <laughs> yes, very, very yeah. proper. Um, yeah. All right. So if you could write for any existing property, what would it be? Doctor Who, that was easy. Next. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I'll be honest. I'm sure Charlie somewhere. and everyone are about to comment in about 10 seconds because we're on a little bit of a delay with them. I would watch the Jonathan L. Howard Doctor Who episode on repeat. Oh my God, that would be spectacular. Um, I'm as I am as old as Doctor Who. In fact, I'm a few weeks older than Doctor Who, the the TV series. Uh, I am that ancient. I grew up with Doctor Who. I remember Dalek Mania in the sixties, um, and I've been faintly obsessed with the series forever, and. Yeah, oh God, I, I I have actually written spec Doctor Who scripts. They're lurking on my machine right this minute. Um, I've pitched Doctor Who novels several times down the years. I would love to write for Doctor Who. And just so you know, all of our, our people on here now are losing their minds at the idea of a Jonathan L. Howard Doctor Who. I am sure someone is going to try and hack that computer uh, to try and find Please don't. Those, those. Yeah, like you're like no, don't no, 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 don't, don't, don't look at my computer. Don't see what's going on uh, there. There is actually a Doctor Who reference in Johannes Cabal the Necromancer. I really am going to have to annotate that book one of these days because it's heaving with little jokes and references. Uh, there's a bit where Cabal is listing things that he's confronted and that haven't disturbed him, but. Um, he bumps into this really nice vicar, and that disturbs him. But on the list of things that he's encountered is uh, the gargoyle Bok. And the gargoyle Bok is featured in the Doctor Who story, uh, The Demons, from 1973, somewhere around there. So there you go. There's a Doctor Who reference right in the first book. Spectacular. Yeah, I, I, I love that particular scene with the vicar, you know, where Johannes mm. goes, well, I'm a Satanist. How's that working for you? Just very, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's really great. Um, all right, <clears throat> a Christmas at Maple Durham publication update. Right, well, the thing's written. Um, it's um, it still needs some editing. It still doesn't have a publisher at the moment, but that's more because it's not really been um, run around potential publishers at the moment because I've got a novel as well. And that's what's getting the heavy lifting for my agency at the moment. Once that's out of the way, then they'll lean more into um, finding a place for the novella. <clears throat> I mean, there's a couple of obvious homes for it. Um, Tor.com would be the obvious one. So, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Maple Durham was finished a good while ago. I'm, I'm more than happy with it. I think I've done good work there. It was interesting going back to writing Cabal after a gap of a two or three years. Um, he still sounds like Cabal, um, and it's a uh, it's a mystery story again. So it's a return to the kind of vibe of um, Jonas Cabal, the detective. Uh, but it's a Christmas mystery this time, and again, it's very Agatha Christie. It's uh, it all takes place at an isolated, stately home, which is Maple Durham, of the title. Uh, this next question: Would you consider a spin-off with Miss Smith? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I've, I am playing around with ideas for um, uh, 
Miss Smith. Oh, Miss Smith, actually. No, I've gone on a complete tangent. It was, I heard Miss Smith, and I, you said Miss Smith, and I heard Leonie Barrow. Miss Smith, you know, I don't know. Um, I like Miss Smith. Um, she's fun to write. She's a bit willful. She's a necromancer as well. Um, she's actually half based on a real person as well. Uh, a friend of mine insisted on being included in something at some point, so I, I went, okay, fine. And she is actually called, um, she's actually Miss Smith in real life. Um, so, yes, actually, I hadn't thought too heavily about bringing Miss Smith back. I was kind of bit half expecting her to do the thing that she does. Um, <clears throat> my original vague notes for um, Fall of the House didn't include her but then I was writing a particular scene and I thought why wouldn't she be here this makes sense to me and so up she popped um, and she tends to do that she tends to uh, just kind of pop into the ratiocinations and um, and insist on having stuff written about her uh, so yes although I don't have anything planned it is not beyond the bounds of possibility okay uh, this next one <coughs> Um, you know, you know, that sort of ties in with my final question. Uh, okay. It does look like, uh, yeah, someone commented, uh, Marty, Hend Marty Herrick, I'm sorry, Leonie and Miss Smith would be wonderful partners, I think. Yeah, I think so too. I think that would make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so the final question, I think the, the big question, I follow not just yourself on Twitter, but also Johannes Cabal's Twitter, which I've always been curious what the relation is there. Um, at one point, there was a somewhat oblique reference to someone, possibly Horst, going through Johannes' old case files. Is there anything next or new for Johannes Cabal the Necromancer? Well, um, the most immediate thing is, um, is Christmas Maple Durham, finding a publisher for that. Um, but also on the back burner, I l like writing detective stories for him um, in different milieu. And so I do have some notes lurking around for um, a little collection of maybe two or three um, short stories, all of which are cabal solving mysteries not necessarily criminal mysteries some of them might be historical mysteries or occult mysteries but it's it's him getting his it's him getting his sherlock on really um and those notes are lying around um so if i do the next thing specifically cabal not just possibly cabal's world but specifically cabal himself will probably be um one or other of those short stories. What I'd do with those then, I don't know, self-publish or look at getting them published in one or other um, periodical, I don't know. Um, that's some way down the track yet. And as I say, I'm, I'm writing this um, this low, well, high-ish, I guess, high-ish fantasy thing at the moment, which I'm enjoying doing. So it'll, they'll ha they'll have, it, Johannes is just going to have to wait his turn. Uh well, just so you know, uh, Gareth L. Powell actually hopped in the live chat and thank you for the shout out. So, oh, hey, hey, Gareth. Uh, yeah. So you're, you're you're reaching out to people across the the internet here. Um, all He's right. just down the road, actually. But you know. Oh yeah, he should pop over. Come hi. Come say hi. Um, yeah. So it has been almost two hours, everyone. I feel like we should probably let Jonathan go. Thank you. Yeah, all. I ran out of beer ages ago. I know, right? I was debating getting that second one, and I went, eh, yeah. it's best not. <laughs> um, so thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, we have a Detective and Necromancer in the store at Town Book Center, which is in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. You can also always order from us at townbc.com. There's an E at the end of town, so T-O-W-N-E-B-C.com. And we are also going to be bringing in uh, the rest of the canon as well. I have so far had Necromancer and Detective as staff picks. Um, Fear Institute is next. And then I will work my way through uh, Brothers Cabal and the Fall of House of Cabal. 
as well for staff picks. I adore these books. If you come into the store, you will probably see me. I have a mask on normally. I'm in my home right now, so I don't have to. Um, and I will talk with you about these books to no end because I absolutely adore them. And Jonathan, just so you know, basically all of the comments now in the live stream are people thanking you uh, for doing this uh, and and taking some time out of your evening now uh, to <laughs> chat with us. So, and again, as as now, I'll put my fanboy hat on. I am so appreciative that you did this with us. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic, and uh, I'm gonna I'll, I'll I'll switch it back to you, and then we'll end the live stream, and then. We'll chat for a second, and I'll turn off the cameras, and we should all be good. So I'm kicking it to you now. Okay. Well, it, it's been a, it's been a lovely best part of two hours, and, and thank you everybody for coming. It's hugely appreciated. It's um, it's a it's a solitary sort of gig, so things like this. It's nice to know that it's going out then, and um, people are enjoying it. As I said earlier, what I Right, I write primarily to entertain, and the knowledge that it it succeeds in that it means a great deal to me. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you in the store. Have a great rest of your evening.